Welcome back, everybody. This is Eric and Chad here with Iraq Veteran 8888. Today, we have another gun gripe episode for you. We're going to be diving right into the weeds on this ATF final brace ruling, if you will. And this has got a lot of folks in the industry up in arms, of course. And we are going to get into this and discuss it a good bit. Uh, we've had a lot of requests from you guys to cover this. And uh, there's already been like a ton of information put out about this. Uh, we wanted to kind of put our two cents in and for what it's worth, uh, give you some of our thoughts on it, where we think it's going to go, what we think the connotations are for gun owners. And, you know, it's just uh, more tyranny, more uh, overreach, more overstepping of boundaries. Like Dave Chappelle would say, a habitual line stepper. That seems to be the ATF's MO. Uh, if there's a line, they're going to cross it. And I think they certainly have crossed a few lines, uh, but we're going to discuss why and get into this a bit today. You know, to be fair, Chad, we, we, we kind of, you know, the writing was on the wall. We knew that a brace ruling was going to come down eventually, and we've done a few videos where we've discussed this concept, and originally it was going to come down in December. We saw that that didn't happen, and then they were saying, well, sometime in January, and of all days, they dropped it on Friday the 13th, right before SHOT Show. It's like someone at the ATF has a sense of humor, at least. Well, I think they're trolling. So They are. Yeah. Well, they know SHOT Show's coming yeah. up. They know it's going to be the talk. You know, everyone mm -hmm. talking about it. The industry is going to have to pivot. So, man, where do we start? Let's just let's break this down a bit for them. I don't know. Uh, I'd like to start with images from the ATF's booth at SHOT Show. I'm curious about all the people over there, like, bugging the hell out of them, you know? Oh, I'm sure they're going to get a million questions. Um, so, we've done videos on the brace rule when it came out, and, like, you know, the final rule isn't terribly dissimilar. They did get rid of that stupid worksheet, you know, but like we thought the worksheet was pretty arbitrary and ambiguous, but like the wording in this final rule is even worse, mm. like because there's no specificity, if you will, to the factoring criteria that they're throwing out there. It's like, and we'll talk about it, but man, it's like, well, the is this brace okay or is it not like it really is almost in the eye of the beholder at that point like you know it's up to them like whether or not they charge you with a crime for possessing a piece of plastic you well, know on something that was okay you know 10 years ago imagine so. being the devil and you're going to write a contract for somebody's soul right do you think for one second that that contract is going to be written anywhere to be fair to the person whose soul you're trying to get? No. If the ATF is going to come up with some rules like this, of course, they're going to make it as ambig you know, ambiguous as possible, right? And they're also going to give themselves the most latitude to go, oh, this is really what we meant, or this is really what we meant, and they can just apply it however the heck they want. Mm -hmm. And because this lacks congressional oversight, that's the biggest issue, Right laws have to pass through congress and this isn't changing the law this is just them going well this is how we interpret the law that currently stands but if it has the weight of law and you know you can be arrested and or fined or jailed or worse or your dog shot or whatever over it is that not by definition the law you know, it's this chevron deference rulemaking process that we've always said it, it has a lot of flaws about it right chevron deference was always meant to be used in a way um, that that involved kind of, you know, very tiny little changes or like a simple little change that maybe they don't want to bother Congress about a certain thing and they can just make a little rolling uh, rule change that doesn't have like a ton of, you know, real clout that would, that would be in line with this. I mean, and then you have the rule of lenity, which we've discussed in previous videos, right? Uh, you know... Of course, going to jail for 10 years and being fined $100,000 and having your dog shot at 3 o'clock in the morning, uh, that doesn't exactly uh, seem to me like it's something that comes in the rule of lenity. Uh, that sounds to me like that's certainly in favor of, uh, of the man. Uh, you know what I mean? So just to give you all some context and history of like braces themselves. So 2012, the first submission to the ATF, um, you know, was was done on a braced AR, right? And, like, remember the original, like, SB SIG braces that popped out, you know, and everything? And um, since, since 2012, there's been a number of different um, assessments, you know, by the ATF of braced firearms. And 
whether or not they turn an AR pistol or an AK pistol into a short barreled rifle, right? And they always come back, um, you know, and the answer is no, right? And there was a whole kerfuffle, as you like to say, right, with shouldering of a brace and whether it converts uh, a pistol into a short barreled rifle, and that was thrown out as well, right? So common sense prevailed. Well, now, so what they're basically saying is that all the previous, like, assessments uh, were were to be thrown out, you know, more or less. So the final yeah. rule. So we is said what it was it legal, but really, mm. we just can change our mind and say it isn't. Yeah. And so, by the way, you're all felons. Yeah. Give me your money. Um, so, anyways, what what they're doing and how they're doing this and going about it is they're changing the regulatory definition of a rifle. All right. So scroll down to the next maybe. Which they page. can't do without changing the law. Yeah. Well, so what they're doing is they're changing the um, they're changing it uh, in the CFA. So it's uh, Commerce and Firearms Ammunition Regulations. All right, so right here, summary of the change. All right, the final rules definition of a rifle states clearly that the term designed, redesigned, made, or remade and intended to be fired from the shoulder includes a weapon that is equipped with an accessory component or other rearward attachment, uh, e.g. a stabilizing brace that provides surface area that allows the weapon to be fired from the shoulder, provided other factors, as described in the rule, indicate the weapon is designed, made, or intended to be fired from the shoulder. All right, so... The other factoring criteria that were on uh, the worksheet, uh, the initial worksheet, right, where they had the point-based system. And if you got over a certain number of points, you were naughty, naughty, naughty. All right, included, like, the the sights that you uh, had on the gun. You know, whether they were, a, um, you know, like an LPVO with a short sight uh, or short eye relief that required you to hold the gun up to your shoulder to be able to, you know, actually use the, the, the sights as intended, or if it had a uh, particular iron sights on it, that the rear aperture needed to be close to your eye, like nose to the charging handle type deal, mm-hmm. the length of pull, the weight. So they're, they're basically taking all those factors off that worksheet and throwing them into these ambiguous, uh, you know, reclassifications of the regulation itself. They're certainly giving themselves the latitude to do more damage than good, right? Yep. You know, and again, that sort of goes completely against the rule of lenity, right? You know, if they're setting this thing up to, to have a giant gotcha moment, never mind that it's really just a giant registry, right? Only Congress has the authority to assess or waive taxes, right? Congress is a taxing authority. They can they can assess or waive taxes. We don't have to agree with it, but only Congress has the right to assess taxes, right? The ATF, right, when they initially did that first machine gun, um, you know, ban, or no, they did, I'm sorry, it wasn't a machine gun ban. They did like the, uh, the amnesty registration. That required an act of Congress. So what I wonder is, how can they waive a $200 tax stamp if this didn't go through Congress? It didn't require an act of Congress for them to do this, which then again, I guess the entire reasoning uh, behind what they're doing is using Chevron deference or using some rulemaking allowance that they're given or using that latitude to basically bypass Congress, right? So if they could just bypass Congress to make the rule change, then why not back bypass Congress to say, well, we're just going to waive the tax stamp, which I, I find to be very odd. Okay. So they're saying, well, we're going to allow essentially an amnesty registration. All right, so what would that look like? It's, it's estimated that there's 40 million brace owners in the United States. Okay. Now, for one, if that's not common use under Bruin and under Heller, I don't know what is. Right. We're going to get into that in a minute. Right. Right. Because remember, Scalia said, you know, common use. Right. That common use thing keeps getting thrown around. I mean... Common use, if 40 million people own a certain piece of technology, I'd say that's freaking common use. But, all right, you have 120 days to register 40 million braces. What would that look like? That would require them to process 333,333.333 forms every single day for 120 days straight in order for those 40 million people to not be felons. One, they don't have the capacity to do that even if they wanted to, right? And if we took that number, let's just kind of round it out to the 333333, and let's multiply that by $200. They are waiving $66,666,600 in tax stamps every single day for 120 days. 
Now, now look, that is a top end estimation. Now that is a top end estimation, but it goes to show you, right? We're sending all this money to Ukraine. We're wasting all this money. We have all this pork and these black projects and all this crap going on, right? I'm not suggesting people should have to pay a tax stamp. I'm suggesting completely that the tax stamp is unlawful and unconstitutional, right? If you can't tax a right, right? There's been several Supreme Court cases that have ruled in situations where, okay, you know, you can't have a polling tax, for instance. Well, a polling tax is unconstitutional because it's your right to vote. You can't place a financial barrier between the voter and their right to vote, right? That's disenfranchising those people who have now had an unfair bird in place between their rights and the exercising of that right. Why is the Second Amendment treated any differently, right? It should not be required to have to register your guns or be a part of some big brother, you know, freaking overlord system that they can peek under your freaking roof and have to submit a $200 tax stamp just because the configuration of the gun that you happen to want is useful. That's the issue, okay? If I want to have a suppressor on my gun, it shouldn't freaking matter. I shouldn't have to tell Uncle Sam about my suppressor. If I want to have a short gun in a handy configuration that I can maneuver in my home effectively and hurt someone who's trying to hurt my family back, I, it has nothing to do with the government. It has nothing to do with the government, right? The Second Amendment doesn't say, well, shall not be infringed, oh, but what guns we say you can have, right? In 1791, right, there were murderers and bandits all over the roads and civilians who were traveling the roads in 1791. You know, there were states that weren't even states yet. You're going in these unincorporated areas in the middle of nowhere. You're literally in Indian country. You're literally murderers and bandits, you know, robbing and looting, and doing all kinds of terrible things, right? And what guns did those people have when they were traveling the roads? The exact same guns that the military had. If not, probably... They would saw down guns and all sort of stuff to have a short, handy gun to have in case a road bandit tried to hurt their family. In fact, I just saw a really interesting little mini series uh, on YouTube that involved this famous, like infamous, um, pair of brothers who were America's first serial killers. And around that time, it was it was before 1791, but around that time. They were traveling all around the Southeast, and in their career, they killed over 40 people that they know of. And they would just, you know, they would be on the road at large, and they would just kill random people for sport. So you can't sit there and say that civilians don't have the right to have the same protection that you are afforded. You know, your life is not more important than the lives of American citizens, right? If you can have an MP7 in your freaking armory then we should be able to have an MP7 beside our bed because if it's good for you, it's good for us. And that is the tradition under which the Second Amendment was written. The rules and traditions and heritage of the way the Second Amendment was written when it was written, right? You didn't have bans on particular guns or particular configurations in 1791. Under the Bruin Standard, all of this is unconstitutional. Absolutely right. And the Supreme Court justices were very smart in making the assessment that they did when it came to this Bruin standard. Now, we see situations like New York and a few other places where, of course, the local governments are just saying, we don't care about your Supreme Court ruling. We're going to do what we want anyway. Now, of course, a lot of this stuff is being challenged in court, as it will be continuously. But at what point are we at a crossroads where, okay, the Supreme Court says the Bruin standard, it must pass the smell test. And you have some municipalities who are going, okay, we'll comply with the Supreme Court ruling. Or, okay, the lower courts, like the Fifth Circuit Court that wound up throwing out this bump stock fiasco under the same premise of, you know, hey, you can't abuse Chevron deference. If that's an abuse of Chevron deference, why, why isn't the brace rule? especially when the brace rule affects a disproportionately larger group of people than the bump stocks do. So if the bump stocks can't pass the smell test, the braces certainly can. It's going to be tied up in the court for a while. Oh, though. it's going to so, be tied up in the court. Now, does that mean they're going to arrest a bunch of people and try to make an example of them? Does it mean we're going to have a hundred mini Wacos? Does it mean that what people does are, mean? does it mean that like normal law abiding people out there are going to be fearful of it and just comply? Likely so. 
right? All right, so, Some. like, scroll, scroll on down. Let's let's get to the fun stuff. I didn't mean to get off on no. that rant, but you're look. You said two cents earlier. I think you just gave like ten bucks. I gave the ten bucks. All right, so look, um, keep going, keep going, keep going. Mm-hmm. Fun stuff. I said fun stuff, not words. Come on, let's go to the pictures. Come on, let's see the pictures. Keep going, keep going. All right, all right. So look, th- this is this is fun. All right, here we go. Right here. All right, now <laughs> I was talking about surface area. All right, they're talking about surface area. Nowhere in the rule did I see a specific measurement of area of what they're considering. You know. A naughty surface area to be so in this image here they have several different varieties of braces like you know you've got the original brace over there on the left you got the sba3 it looks like there um you've got the shockwave blade you've got like the the q style braces on like the uh the honey badgers and everything and then you got a tail hook on the end right mm-hmm. so they're showing that all these braces have sufficient surface area to be considered stocks under this rule right so that pretty much wipes out everything, you know, that, that we know of as being a braced firearm, as being non-compliant. Okay. Now they're they're not saying they're banning braces entirely. That's one thing that specifically was mentioned. But they're they're arguing the, the point that like the braces are not being used for the uh, intended and originally like approved purpose. Which the was, Gun Control Act does not say anything about how guns are used. I know. The Gun Control Act says what guns are. It defines what guns are. I know. Hey, this is a shotgun. This is they're, a rifle. They're this is regulating. A they're regulating the use of said items in this rule, which they have no right to do. Which will likely, you know, go into the court system and it'll be fault just like the bump ca- bump stock case is. But in the interim. This is, I mean, once this thing is actually published in the register, it's been signed by the attorney general. Once it's published, that's when the fun starts. So, all right, look, look right here at this image. All right now, this is about weight or length. All right, similar, similar items to be treated similarly. All right, so did Kamala Harris write this? I have no idea, but like, all right, so you got a, a Q um, honey badger, right? So why, why they got to pick on Kevin? You know, you've got a brace up top and a stock on the bottom. You know, you can look at it and you can understand the ATS reasoning, but the actions that they're taking are completely out of the bounds of their regulatory ability, technically. All right. And under the letter of the law, um, you know, the chassis guns, they're out of here, you know, too. So basically if you own anything that is similar to any of the images in this rule, like they're going to, they're going to be looking at it with a microscope. All right. So now we're talking about length of pull. Yeah, length right. of pull. Uh, keep going. All right. All right. And then sites. the sites. This is all the stuff, like I mentioned, was on the original worksheet. You know, like, just my personal opinion, if... <sighs> so even if the gun didn't have a brace on it, if you have an optic on it, they're still considering it a rifle. I don't think so. It's really with the brace on there. If you've got... All right. So you got an AR, all right, that requires the buffer tube to be in place all right for the function this is another thing they specifically mentioned in the rule all right if if the ar has a, a receiver extension all right it's a technical term protruding from the rear that is um, instrumental to the function of said firearm you know it has to be a smooth tube it has to be a it round can't tube. accept an accessory it cannot accept a brace right does right? the gun control act say anything about that no all right well then it's not Look, the law it, it's it not the law. It doesn't. But look, what they're what they're referring to is the CFA, the Commerce and Firearms and Ammunition. All right, they're changing the definition in in the regulatory scope. This is the same thing that they did with machine guns. They tried to change the regulatory definition of what a machine gun was to include bump stocks, but we saw what happened with that. And they likely, said, what's going to happen with this? What's likely going to happen with this? Because the NFA and the GCA specify what um, a rifle is what a handgun is, what a short-barreled rifle is. All right, nowhere in there does it say anything about how it's used, what sights you have on it, what the length of pull is. It doesn't say anything. There's no correct or incorrect way to shoot a gun. No, this is all regulatory. It's not under the letter of, like, the U.S. Code law. Okay, What they're suggesting requires Congress. Like, it requires a law change by Congress. We've already been through that, but, like, if, if you're handicapped... All right, if you're in a wheelchair or something and you have a hard time holding up an AR pistol, you can likely still have a braced firearm. As long as, I, like, that that's just my opinion. Like, that's what they're going after. That's what they're saying. 
But if you're normal Joe and you got a brace on your AR, you either have to register it or get it out of there. And like they're given options. They're giving options like like it's Christmas or something. But the ATF has laid out options for people with braced firearms. And like just from the way that I read into it, like if you have a brace, and this was the previous opinion uh, when the rule was kind of being drafted and everything, but if you had a brace and you just removed it, right, that mm-hmm. was good enough. As long as it wasn't on the gun in question, it was okay. But now... It's right. not. But if like, that rifle tube's on there, you got to remove the rifle tube as yeah, well. It's got, so you it, might as well strip the gun yeah. down if you're not going to register it. So, like, it, according it, to them. If you, if you have the brace in your possession, you're still in possession of an illegal firearm, in, in the ATF's opinion. Now, like, what they do in California, like, with, with having to comply with the draconian rules there, all right? If you've got, say, uh, you, you, you've got a gun that has uh, a car stock on it, all right? An AR with a car stock. And uh, any other state, for the most part, you could have it as a collapsible, you know, in and out, whatever, short length of pull, long length of pull, whatever. So California outlaws collapsible stocks. So what people do out there is they'll hard pin them in place so they're not adjustable. They'll put them in the place that they want, and then they'll affix a pin that prevents the movement of the uh, lever, all right, that allows the stock to reciprocate back and forth, all right? So... Is that to say that you could pull the brace off and drill a hole in it and put a roll pin through it and then it's not readily accessible to be dropped back on that firearm and still retain possession of it until after all this crap blows over? Or if you pulled the or if you pulled the brace off and the rifle tube that's on it, they made some like plastic clamshell that you could put over the top to like it's gotta be close the close the holes up and then like pin it in place. Well, yeah. And then it's maybe. A slick maybe but you have then when to all this blows over you pull it out. well like i'm i'm serious like i'm i'm dead serious in this like i really feel like this is going to i mean the lawsuits are already in line the you know they're they're already lined up ready to be like thrown out of the printer and thrown in the mail and you know put on a horse <laughs> look, you know look at sights or scope and they show <laughs> they show an acog which who who do we know that has an acog on their 22 chad what? All right, that's and then that's look at—they got a magnifier on this on this cue, and then look at the yeah. bottom. They got freaking this absurd thermal. freaking thermal <laughs> on this AR pistol. Well, look, I'm wondering if they pulled these images off of some forum, you know, for the most part. I mean, it looks like a lot of well, they've got were, YouTube video stills. Yeah, oh, they do, um, but it's from S and B's. But um, like, um, YouTube. I, I think that if you if you have a bunch of brace firearms and we haven't even gotten to talk about the other other things yet that we're just talking about ars with a with a receiver extension on them but if you hard pin them in place i wonder if that will be acceptable but like we won't know until somebody submits you know a classification or a determination letter to the atf some ffl is going to do that eventually and they'll they'll determine whether or not you know just putting a hard pin in place or something like that blocking you know blocking the hole at the end so you can't insert it over a receiver extension is going to be good enough to be able to store it legally. legally. Listen to this mental gymnastic. Wrap your mind around this. Listen carefully to the words about to come out of my mouth. Mm -hmm. An AR-type pistol with a standard 6 to 6.5 inch buffer tube may not be designed and intended to be fired from the shoulder, even if the buffer tube provides surface area (laughs) that allows the firearm to be shoulder fired because it is required for the cycle of operations of the weapon. I know. So basically Ambiguity. what they're saying is if you wrap 550 cord around the stupid thing and shoulder it, it doesn't fall under the you know, and and the one they even the one they show even has a foam pad on the end of it. Yep. Which Well, that's, you know, that's a cheek pad, man, you know. But hey, you know, look. <laughs> look, I you uh, know one thing I didn't see in this whole in this whole uh document. It's a tennis ball. Yeah, you know they I mean? really missed a crucial opportunity. To but show look, the tennis back ball. in the day before braces were around, man, people would just stick tennis balls on the back of their receiver extensions when they had pistols, and like they'd put them on the shoulder and shoot them all the damn time, you know. But it's I, I think now it's the proliferation of social media and you know just the dissemination of images and configurations and things like that that people share all across the internet. I mean, look, you know, we and others have shown braces being used. Uh, you know, in a normal sense. And it doesn't change the classification of the weapon per previous ATF determinations and classifications. So let's go over the rearward attachment. Now, this is where we get into designs that do not have a receiver extension 
that mm -hmm. is required for the gun to operate. And we're talking AKs, MP5s, and of course they show braced uh, MP5s and AKs here. Now, uh, you remember when AK pistols really came, uh, you know, in, into favor quite a bit? Um, you know, there was a time when they were around, but they weren't quite as prevalent. And, and then they went through a time where it was like, it was like a couple of year period where it was like the year of the AK pistol. Like everyone was buying Dracos and Paps and everything. I mean, look, I, I bought one. I loved it. And I, I ended up SBR in mine some time back, you know, so... Let's look at this. The manufacturer's marketing and promotional materials for a weapon are relevant in considering the likely use of the firearm in the general community. Where in the Gun Control Act does it cover how a firearm's used? That, uh, that's what I want to know. Like, where in the Gun Control Act does it say anything about how a firearm can and cannot be used? <clears throat> it doesn't. It doesn't. Um, Yep. So, like, they're literally showing images here of promotional materials from SIG. That's a POF up there, you mm -hmm. know, and yeah, they're shouldering a brace. Is that Tim? Uh, no, it kind of looks like Tim. It does look like Tim. I wonder if they did that on purpose. Maybe that's a younger version of Tim. I don't know. It doesn't look quite look like him. He's got the wrong nose. Well, but that would be convenient to have Tim in two lawsuits because he's be. already on the bump stock one. Might he well might be him on the brace in this one. one already. Um, but anyways, it still doesn't <laughs> Sorry, change. <Tim. laughs> it still doesn't change. The classification of what that weapon is it just doesn't so mm. like the man <sighs> final rule options for categories of affected parties here are your options yeah. boys and girls all right according so, to the atf all right so we are you already mentioned you know uh and like an amnesty registration period right um i'm but, wondering where they have the authority to, to waive a tax. They technically Only don't. Only Congress has the authority to waive taxes. They technically don't. But they're finding some, what do they call it, juris, jur, jurisprudence or whatever. I can't remember what the term is. But so, like, they're saying that, um, like, 07 FFLs, like what we are, it's not going to affect us. We can just form two anything, and it doesn't matter. But, like, regular individuals have, you know, 120 days after the rules published to uh register it if they want to or you know pull the brace off and render it inoperable right uh or or add a 16 inch barrel to you know take it out of classification as a pistol and then it would be classified as a rifle at that point which that's relatively easy for certain firearms but it's impossible without a gunsmith for others you know like mp5s like ak's you got to have you know huge hydraulic presses to get those barrels and stuff in there um, on those type of guns. It's not as easy as pulling a handguard off and rotating the barrel nut off and switching the barrel out. For clarification, all right, just for those of y'all that don't know, it is legal to convert a pistol to a rifle and not the other way around. Yes. So if you have a rifle and you go, well, I want to convert it, I want to put a shorter barrel on it and leave the stock mm -hmm. on or whatever, you're technically not supposed to do it. Yeah. Which Once, a, once a rifle, always a rifle. Once a rifle, always a rifle. But a pistol, if you put you know, the final configuration winds up being that of a rifle. You can take a pistol and convert it to a rifle. Now, here's the thing that gets me without getting too far in the weeds, but I just want to mention this too. What's to stop somebody from, you know, whoever has a pile of Anderson receivers saying, oh, free SBRs, you know, and, and, and then just completely bog down the system by registering their strip lowers who that was never a gun to begin with. That's one... Um that's one detail that I haven't quite been able to figure out because the the way I read into this is the amnesty period is for is for firearms that were sold in the questioned or you know in the configurations that are of concern. So if you built it, it doesn't count. You need to do whatever. But they're saying that if you bought a Smith and Wesson or Daniel Defense that was in a factory available configuration. What they're essentially saying is, we know you have it, so you might as well register. Yeah. So they could find out. Yeah. So look, I, I don't. This isn't really. This isn't a period for people to register like five or ten SBRs, which I hope doesn't mean they won't. I, I, I know. Look, people are dumb. People <laughs> in the dumb community are really dumb sometimes. Look, I mean, no offense, y'all, but we're we're a bunch of idiots sometimes. You know, don't and do it. I really think that you know one of two things is going to happen. Either a lot of people are just going to say, screw this crap. I'm just going to take my brace off and put a pin in it or something and hide it until all this crap blows over and then go back to business as usual. Or they're going to be like, Ooh, free SBR. Hoo, hoo, hoo. That's like a real FUD mentality this and then bog a, down the system. This is a de facto gun registry. So it absolutely it's, is. it's worth mentioning, right? 
Uh, I actually saw this in part, uh, on, partially on um, a video from Jared at Guns and Gadgets. If you guys aren't following Jared, great channel. Make sure you follow uh, Guns and Gadgets. Make sure you follow the Armed Attorneys. Uh, and it's funny because <laughs> I watched a video from Armed Attorneys and they're like, we're attorneys and we're sitting here telling you we don't know how to advise clients on this. That's how ambiguous it is. Yep. So that should tell you how ambiguous it is. If a client, if a lawyer can't advise a client on it, then that tells you that it's so politically whitewashed. There's just no telling how it can go. But I saw a video from Jared where the ATF and FBI got caught snooping through a database of firearms owners, right? We're talking, they're supposed to have a court order, a warrant to do that. And they have, they have been going through and snooping in records. And they can say all day long, oh, well, it's just a database. It's not a registry. It's a damn database that you can snoop through and look up information. Is that not a registry? So really what this is on, on, the, on the base level where the icebergs are floating around, it's really a registry. It's a de facto gun registry. They want to know who has what, right? And think about it. You've got all these new gun owners who have only become new gun owners in the last couple of years, right? And if they've bought ARs and AKs, chances are, what have they, what have they likely purchased? Pistols, mm -hmm. probably with mm -hmm. braces. And if it didn't have a brace on it, they probably put a brace on it. Because why the heck wouldn't you, right? It's more useful, right? At the end of the day, I want my fellow Americans to have the most useful tools necessary to protect mm -hmm. themselves with. All right, you're the ones that wrote the Gun Control Act. You're the ones that defined what the lines in the in in the road were. Okay, now if my wheel goes right up to the edge of that line and doesn't cross, well, you've set those boundaries, right? The law is what it is, and it isn't what it isn't. Like it's if you want to change those boundaries, you have to go through Congress. That's the issue. So I think this is nothing more than the ATF's attempt to throw spaghetti at the wall and see what sticks, right? I think it's a scream in the dark. I think it's a cry in the dark. I think it's a cry for help. Like, they have exhausted every available mechanism. And I'm, gonna, I'm about to say something that's going to make some people angry, and I hope it makes you angry because it should, right? If de the Democrats had control of the House, Senate, and Presidency. They had control of the ship. Why didn't they change the Gun Control Act to reflect these things when they had control of the ship? And likewise, when the Republicans had control of the ship, Trump was at the helm. We had Republican control in the House and Senate, you know, in theory. Allegedly. Right, allegedly. <laughs> but in theory, right, what could they have done? They could have, all right, maybe not have been able to just completely gut the NFA completely, but they might have been able to say, well, we'll waive the tax stamp and still require registration as a tiny stepping stone towards eventually maybe just gutting the whole program completely. They could have eliminated the tax hmm. when they had control. So see, it's a two-way street. Our people could have eliminated the tax, and they didn't. Because why? Because they like taxes. They like money. Okay? Their side could have actually passed real meaningful law to actually codify into law what these people are doing through Chevron deference. Did they? No, they didn't. You know what's best for business when you're in the government? Status quo. Mm -hmm. Lame duck nothing. Right. When business is good and the grift is on and you're doing every little thing and you're and you're just kind of snaking your way through the grass and nobody's bothering you. You don't want to make waves. Right. You want things to be exactly the way they are. You don't want to change anything that could potentially mess that up. So the Republicans and the Democrats are at fault just in different ways. Right. It, after all, it was Trump who, with the power of the pen, uh, passed his, you know, signed his executive order banning bump stocks. Just as Joseph Biden signed his pen to uh, order the uh, Department of Justice and the ATF to go after uh, these braces. So they're both wrong. Trump and Biden are both wrong, just in different ways. But it's really the same mechanism. Is it not? It is. Um I mean, so, get mad at me if you want, but that's the truth. It's it's the truth. It's the God honest and truth. And by the way, his son blocked me. Trump Jr. blocked me on Instagram for calling his dad out on it. Blocked me. That's the kind of people you're dealing with. Mm -hmm. Can't accept the reality. Well, Can't they, call me like a man and say, well, 
Here's one, oh, 5D chess. Well, give me the 5D chess talk. At least humor me, but block me? Mm -hmm. You know who else blocked me? Shannon Watts. Now, I would expect Shannon Watts to block me, but Trump Jr.? Come on. But, you come know, on, dude. But come on, man. He's like a big time gun guy, right? Goes hunting all the time. I have no doubt. You know? Uh, on, I have no doubt gun the guy, guy loves guns. Man. But now, was it him? Can't or take some, any criticism. Was it him or some handler? Probably some handler. Maybe. Okay, he doesn't handle his own social media. But the point is, though, what a beta thing to do. Well, you can't take a little bit of criticism, you know, when a mistake's made and accept it. Own so. it, live up to it, explain yourself. Even if you give me the 5D chess lie, I don't care. But be a freaking man and just accept it and, and move on with life. Mm hmm. That's how men do things. Like, mm -hmm. men deal with their problems and face it, right? They don't run away from it. Well, speaking of dealing with... I'm just with, saying, this is a real beta thing to do. Speaking of dealing with problems, so the other, the other uh, like, issue that I see, and I'm, I'm not really sure how they're going to handle this, but so, like, you have FFLs that are just normal dealers, right, that may not have an SOT, all right? So... Mm -hmm. If you have an FFL and you have an SOT, that allows you to deal in like NFA items, like suppressors, like short barreled rifles, right? So the the whole premise of the brace rule is to get people to register their braced pistols as short barreled rifles under the purview of the NFA. So if you're an FFL 01, which is a dealer, and you've got, I don't know, you're a small shop, you got 10 braced firearms in there. Well, what are your options? I mean, they're... The ATF is saying that, oh, you have 120 days to register said items and, you know, not have to pay the tax. But see, like, you can register an NFA item as a corporation, as an LLC, as a trust, whatever. You know, it's not an individual thing you know, specifically, but, like, they they could register it and they'd go through the same process that anybody else does. And then, yeah, it'd be an SBR after the fact, but unless they have an SOT, how are they going to transfer it? They're not going to be able to sell it. Yeah. So it would be like owned by the FFL itself and it can't go anywhere else, you know, Isn't which that is strange. I, I haven't quite figured that one out yet, you know, unless they, unless it was like, well, you just transfer it to myself and then I register it myself. But then like you're taking it out of inventory, you're not able to sell it. That's the whole point of having the FFL is to do business. Yeah. Right. But like SOT holders, it won't be a big deal. You could, you could make it. You know, if you're an O1 with an SOT, you're not a manufacturer. You can't file a Form 2 on it. You can file a Form 1, wait for the, the stamp to come back on it, and then you have to have it marked, you know, with your FFL name, but then you could put it on the shelf and you could sell it. But why? Chad, what, why, about, why? what about states that allow pistols but don't allow NFA items? Then the Don't only, allow SBRs. Well, the only option for those FFLs and those individuals is to pull the braces off and... Right. permanently affix some pin or something to them. So let's you know? go over what they're saying are your options. Man. Now, there are options not on this list. <laughs> and I'm not going to tell you what to do and what not to do, but I'm just saying just because there's five on this list doesn't mean this is all, all the options there are. Woo! Number one would be to remove the short barrel and attach a 16-inch or longer rifled barrel to the firearm. All right, I'd like to talk about something real quick on this. Buy a 14-inch and pin and weld a muzzle device on it to make out 16. That way you get the shortest configuration you can. Or, right, instead of registering your rifle, your pistol as a rifle, purchase a suppressor, pay the tax stamp, then pin and weld the suppressor onto your pistol. As long as the overall length is 16, now you're good. Mm -hmm. That's take, an option. Take it out of the naughty configuration for that time period. Yes. You know. And then if the tides of freedom change later on, you could just, you know, knock the pen out, break the weld. Go back to business as usual. And if you did that, you could put a stock on it at you that could. point. Yeah. So say you had a Mark 18. Now, Mark 18 might not be a good example because you'd have to have a pretty long can mm -hmm. to make that length no, out. Six inches. Six Which, inches. That's, that's, a, that's kind a typical of a long can. But that's a typical let, Let's just can. say you had a Mark 18. Pull the muzzle device off, thread your can on there, pin and weld uh, in accordance uh, with the law or whatever, buy the correct Mark 18 stock, put it on there. You now have a rifle. Now you still have to register your suppressor, but in my mind, you can't purchase a suppressor 
let's just say a factory suppressor without, you know, you have to pay the stupid tax stamp to get the suppressor. It's dumb, but it's the system we have in place and it's what we have to work with. And people can say what they want. Oh, well, you're complying if you're paying the tax stamp. Well, yeah, you are. But at the same time, it's like, I think it's very unfair how the ATF has treated suppressors and short rolled rifles, shotguns and machine guns, almost like luxury items. And how there is a gateway, a gatekeeping uh, type of entity uh, to freedom. Like if, if, if my choice is to have a short handy configuration with a suppressor on it to protect my household and protect my wife, who I love dearly and my dogs, then that <laughs> you trusted me to run a Ma Deuce at the age of 20 in Iraq, shooting 750 grain projectiles in the middle of a freaking city. No telling where half those projectiles went. You trusted my 20 year old butt over there with a handgun on my hip, even though I was 20 come on man come on it just doesn't make sense if anybody knows what tools are necessary to protect myself it's definitely freaking me not you number two permanently remove and dispose of or alter the stabilizing brace such that it cannot be reattached number three turn the firearm into your local atf office yeah how about yeah how about no number four destroy the firearm definitely how about no yeah you're building air castles with that buddy Number five, register the weapon as set forth below, depending on your category of possessor, which, of course, we will put the link uh, to this PDF in the description box below. You can read over it. I'm sure you're going to be seeing images uh, in this video as we discuss some of these slides, but feel free to look through those criteria um, as you see fit. So those are basically your five options, according to the ATF. I would say there, there is a sixth option ignore it and the the amount that they know they're not gonna they're still not gonna know that they know now right what they know they know what they know and they don't know what they don't know so in my mind especially if the court if this is obviously this is getting fought in the courts the NRA has already said they're gonna submit a lawsuit FPC has already said they're gonna submit a lawsuit of course GOA um I'm, I'm quite biased. I, I wish you would join GOA, especially here in Georgia. Um, I receive no money in connection with your GOA membership, okay? But if you do scan our QR code down below, we'll, we'll put a link to our, our specific Iraq veteran QR code. You can actually get a discounted membership through GOA. Just a quick note on that if you want to. And I receive absolutely zero uh, from the connection of you clicking that link and choosing to become a member. That is just simply so that you can get a discounted membership and they know that I sent you. That's it. And there is absolutely zero financial compensation uh, regarding that. But GOA will be submitting lawsuit. So this isn't over, right? The, the, the tides of the, <laughs> of the courts, you know, hopefully will, will sort of flow in our favor. Now, does that mean that they still won't try to arrest you after the 120-day period? Well, the courts could certainly put a stay on this thing. They could say, hold the phone. We're just going to you know, freeze this right where it is until we figure all this out. I think that's called a stay, is it not? So they, some some lines, legal term. We're Listen, not legal experts. I'm not a lawyer. Okay. All I can do is try to wade through this cesspool and find the solid pieces as best I can and to present them to you to either hate or love. There's a lot more to hate than there is to love. But the point is, you could simply just ignore the situation. Which I think a lot of people are going to do anyway. Which I think a lot of people will. Because, I mean, remember what happened with bump stocks initially. I mean, most people just ignored it. What I worry about is, it's not the people that know better and choose to ignore. It's the people that don't know better. Yeah. Those are the ones I'm concerned about. You got some single mom who bought a brace pistol because... You know, she thought it would be a handy gun to have in her house to protect her 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 family or whatever. And then, what? Now the ATF is gonna raid that person and take their gun and, and potentially hurt their children and dog over something that. I mean, we're not arguing the semantics over. This is this is my big issue. The ATF is not arguing semantics over whether the configuration of the gun can be possessed or not. Notice that it doesn't say anything about, well, you can't have this. They're saying you can have it. You just have to pay the tax stamp. So if there's a gatekeeper mentality to exercising your rights, if the exercising of my right is dependent on a $200 tax stamp, 
how is that continuously allowed? Like, why has that not been challenged? I don't understand. Because like, it I, hasn't. I, I don't understand how they can continue to place a $200 barrier in front of your ability to exercise your rights, especially when that $200 barrier is not even about the money anymore. $200 is not a lot of money anymore in what it originally was when, when this whole thing came, came to be. It's really about registration. They want to know who has what and where so they can have a registration. And registration leads to confiscation. That is the MO, period. That is the only logical MO that they have at this point is the more guns they know about, the better in their eyes because they want a monopoly on violence, period. They do not want competition. They want to choose who gets to help and who doesn't. And they want to know that they're going to be unopposed at every step. What the is Second the, Amendment is literally the last thing standing in the way. And they know it. We've already seen what happens in Canada without a Second Amendment, right? Rights are just trampled over. Mm -hmm. Natural rights are just trampled over. It doesn't need to be written on a piece of paper to make it true and factual. That's right. Um, you know, Eric, you mentioned uh, the confiscation route. And confiscation is a gateway to extra control right over the populace so, i mean i really think that like just the headache of those that would be willing to just burn the bill of rights burn the constitution as a whole burn the second amendment right they want that control of course they do so, now um, very quickly before we end today's video yeah, i promised earlier i went on twitter and uh, I mentioned on Twitter that Chad and I are cutting this episode, and I wanted to know if y'all had any specific questions or concerns that we should address. I'd like to very quickly, hopefully, go through and answer some of your questions for you. Uh, if you're not following me on Twitter, make sure you're following me at IWriteVeteran8888 on Twitter. I'm very active on Twitter. Some would say quite spicy. I'll take that. That's fine. I probably have an uh, ATF and FBI agent assigned to me, so that's how you know you should listen to me. Wind Talker says, when will the lawsuit be filed? Uh, very soon. Uh, I'm sure that stuff's being worked out right now. I know the NRA and GOA, FPC have all already, you know, they're frothing at the mouth to um, submit uh, lawsuits. So thanks for that question, Wind Talker. How does this affect fixed stocks? It doesn't. Because it's a stock, it's already a rifle. Hypothetically speaking, what can be done if the courts refuse to step in and one of our friends has a pistol brace on an AR that they made from an 80% frame? Uh, you either have to make it compliant or you have to register it during the amnesty period. So those are your choices. If or don't want, get caught. If you're wanting to wait on the courts, well, technically, we can't provide that sort of uh, advice because we're not a legal authority. But I'm not going to tell you what to do, but... Um, you know, me personally, if I had a bunch of brace stuff, you know, as an individual, I would pull the braces off of it, put a hard pin through it, put a round tube on the, uh, as the receiver extension and wait this crap out. Wait till it blows over. I would wait it out. Another probably important point to sort of bring up as well in regards to that is, I'm glad you brought that question up. I foresee the way that this is going to be enforced is likely going to be a situation where, okay, is the ATF going to like go door to door and, and try to look at people's guns and catch them with a naughty configuration? That answer is most certainly no. And the reason I think it's no is because they simply don't have the manpower, right? Everybody thinks of the ATF as this large, big brother, overbearing organization, but you're talking like 5,800 agents total for the entire world. And that includes clerical, people processing paperwork, answering the phone, you name it. Everybody down to the janitor right? Whatever. The actual amount of field agents, the physical amount of people that they put in the field to carry out this type of stuff and to enforce their wills and edicts, which aren't laws, but just simply rules, right? Which is essentially like mafia level stuff. Like they're essentially mafia hitmen in a way. There's like 12, 1400 of them, right? Maybe 1500. And the Democrats just submitted, you know, a potential bill to request 200 more ATF agents. Okay whatever. They still don't have enough manpower. You could have 15,000 people and it wouldn't matter. It's still not enough manpower. So they don't have the manpower. So what they're likely going to do, it's going to be like a tack on type of thing. So you get caught doing some heinous, terrible crap. 
they kick open the the trunk of the car and they find two brace guns they're gonna go all right well you did this heinous thing but we've also got you for another two hundred thousand dollar fine and 20 more years if you don't accept our plea bargain if we you know take our deal or else they're going to use it as a bargaining chip to potentially, you know, make it worse, right? They're going to try to apply more heat to you using that as just one more way that they can do that. And honestly, I think that's the same situation with the switches, right? Okay, so you're in the middle of Chirac, and you're a police officer or a fed that caught someone murdering somebody, which happens multiple times a day, which I'm giving them way too much credit to assume they actually catch someone doing it. But let's just say... You find a Glock with a switch on it. The crime scene, you caught the person. Well, guess what? What? They murdered someone, but then now there's an additional, you know, illegal machine gun tack-on charge. That's the only way I really see them enforcing it in any type of meaningful way. At least, I'm not saying that it should be enforced. I'm not saying that I agree with the enforcement of it. But I'm just saying the only way they can logistically enforce that, unless they go after very specific people, that about, really would be about the only way is like attack on. I mean, that's my the way I look at it. I think it'll be like, you know, they'll be added on to other criminal charges for sure. But I mean, I worry about like domestic violence type stuff or whatever, or like erroneous calls, you know, like red flags and crap like that. And then the cops come to confiscate your guns under a red flag order in a particular state. And then they find like two or three braced firearms and then you're going to get the book thrown at you during this time period. Of course, you and know? and that is absolutely their intention. Um, uh, hang on, I'm getting this uh, mirroring to set up so you can read these comments. Wait, look, I know this video has been pretty long, guys. Please bear with us. I want to respond to some of these comments because some of you brought up um, some very, very good questions. Um, if its overall length is over 26 inches, but the barrel length is less than 16 inches... Is it classified as a firearm, and is if it's equipped with a stabilizing brace, is it considered a brace pistol or a brace firearm? Well, it would be considered a brace pistol because the pistol's rifled. The whole yeah. firearm thing is because it's smoothbore yeah. and not rifled. That's how yeah. they get around that. Just in a nutshell, that's the explanation. More arbitrary things with a the GCA. A smoothbore firearm, NFL. right? It's, it's more of this GA, uh, GCA stuff. Yeah. And the other confusing thing about it is that nowhere in any of this crap in that worksheet we just went through says anything about smoothbore firearms doesn't even mention them there's still a kind of a gray area as far as everything's concerned so does the form have to be approved within the 120 day grace period or just submitted 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 from what i understand the way i read it so box of parts capable of being built versus installed so there's always been this question of like intent right so constructive possession constructive possession they call right it. yeah so like if you've got a box of parts laying around and you intend to build a firearm into an nfa configuration but you haven't done it yet and you haven't filed a form on it they could throw that at you but i've i've really never read too many cases of where that's actually been like a thing but say you've got a bunch of uh you got a bunch of rifles or something like that and then you've got um, like like just AR specifically, and then you've got a, a an 11.5 inch barrel laying around, but you don't have uh, an SBR. Then technically you're in constructive possession of of a short barrel that could be used to convert one of your guns into an illegal SBR. Like technically speaking, looking at the letter of the law, it's dumb, but it's like the the recommended <clears throat> the recommended thing has always been file a form if you're building an SBR. Right, and then getting your parts after the form is approved. That's the general recommendation. Now, and consensus. there's a lot of great questions, and I wish we could cover all of them, but I, I don't want to go too long on time. But I do want to try to provide the most coverage I can on this particular concept because I know folks have a lot of questions. So please bear with me. We want to cover as many of these questions as possible. If you want to click away from the video, it's cool, but I, I really want to answer some of these questions because some of them are good. All right. Um, Christopher says, registering the brace in a trust. My understand, my understanding is my register is individual form one and taxes waived. Do I need to file form four to transfer into a trust and pay the tax? Yes. Unfortunately, yes. Yeah, anytime a firearm like that changes hands, you know, to another entity, there is a, a tax associated with it unless it's FFL to FFL. All right, the late Boy Scout says, part. 
Um, I haven't heard anyone address this. So let's say I comply and I toss the brace, but just the brace, not the included buffer tube. Can I keep that existing part on the gun and be compliant, or is that buffer considered part of the brace? It's considered um, a rifle an integral, extension. Yeah, it's considered a rifle extension at that point. It has to be you know, pulled off and put in a parts bin and a round tube has to be put on it, from my understanding. Yeah, so, unfortunately. Yeah. All right, Zuko Momo says, is it just the braces that wrap around your arm, or is it the fin stocks as well? I don't care either way. Not complying. In fact, I want to build an AR pistol with a brace more than ever now. Yes. It's everything. It, it, yeah. it showed that particular blade yeah. brace that yeah. you're discussing in the worksheet. You can you could click the link below. I don't agree with that. I think it's dumb, but I'm just telling you what it says. All right, last question. Uh, 922R compliance uh, issues with this. Good question. That is a, that's a further deep dive. That is a very distinctive point of contention. So like, all right, with 922R, you're talking about like importation rules and things like that and how a firearm is configured if it's converted into something else like the Segas. Segas would come in and they would be in more of like a sporting type configuration and then you had to change out a certain number of parts to U.S. produce parts to meet that requirement for 922R for imp uh, imported firearms to be able to put like a collapsible stock, uh, a pistol grip, you know, other accessories and things like that onto it because um, you're changing the configuration. So it has to meet that, that compliance. So the thing with that and this rule, I mean, I don't really see it affecting it a whole lot because all you're doing is removing one component. You're not adding new components technically unless you're SBR in it. But my understanding has always been that if you have an imported firearm and you SBR, you're filing a Form 1 as a maker, you're converting it into another configuration where really 922R doesn't Irrelevant. really apply anymore because you know you have made it into something else that's covered under a... Uh, 922R has law. to do with import restrictions yeah. and import configurations, not in the configuration it is once it's SBR'd. Once it's SBR'd, you remake it. So you're technically, you're technically like the new manufacturer. And we know they like to deal in technically. So that, that's, technically, that's always been it. my understanding, and that's what a lot of folks in the industry have told me in the past. So. Yep. I think that covers things pretty well, and um, you know, I, I really wanted to weigh in on this. I know there's already been a lot of content out there. I mean, look, there's a great video from Mr. Guns and Gear. Um, Jared at Guns and Gadgets has got a great uh, you know, video on this. Even Yankee Marshall weighed in. Tons of people. Look, everybody is talking about this, so we wanted to weigh in and discuss it. And there's a lot of great opinions out there, and there's a lot of great content out there. If you have further questions or concerns or you just want you know more opinions other than ours there are tons of fantastic videos about this mike glover put out a video mm -hmm. um gosh i think tim uh at military arms channel i believe put out a video on this i've been seeing videos everywhere because right now this is the talk of the town there's a lot going on of course this week shot show is going on so it's been kind of crazy i gladly am not there i'm comfortably at home coof free shot show crud free Booth bunny crud free. No alcohol. I quit drinking. Mm, me I don't too. drink no more. Ah, I'm getting old. Mm -hmm. But y'all enjoy SHOT Show. If you are there, uh, you know, I do regret that I'm not there to see some of you. I, I do enjoy catching up with a lot of folks. And, you know, but um, at the same time, I don't miss it. It is a hustle and bustle that I don't look forward to because it's like, dude, it's like, 18 20 hour days with mm -hmm. everything that goes on go get a little sleep get up in the morning go to the media room start uploading and editing videos <sighs> and then hit the floor film all day back and forth back and forth back the and forth the only thing that i miss <laughs> is that lightning fast media room internet oh like, dude it's so fast you can upload a youtube video like well like at, at the time like i had like a maybe a 40 or 50 meg connection at the house and that room was like gig speed plus up and down it could upload like a 10 minute it's video like a and direct <laughs> injection into the matrix like i don't know what they do like they plug you in somewhere i, I, I do know. enjoy going to and seeing everybody and you know there's a lot of folks we haven't seen in quite a while and i like vegas at least for you know those few days i like the antique arm show I'm that's, gonna miss that. I know yeah. that's my favorite part of it, but yeah, you know, maybe we can go next year. If y'all are at shot, enjoy yourselves. Be mm -hmm. careful. Don't get the coof. Yep. Don't get sick, which you're gonna. Just I hold, can say that. Look, yeah. I, if I walk back through there, I think I just take my like scuba gear with me. I take my my uh, mask, you know, in my my tank, and I would just run the regulator through there, like 
Yep. Yeah. That's it. I won't breathe their air. That's the thing. Hope everybody has a great day. <laughs> we we covered this as best we could. I know this video was long, but I really appreciate you tuning in. And if you're still here, thank you so much for watching and being a part of what we do. We tried our best to answer your questions and to provide hopefully the most valuable insight we possibly can based on our limited Neanderthal understanding of the law. Um, well, we are just uncouth, uncouth rednecks. Take it or leave like it, but there it is. Hope everyone has a fantastic day. Thanks so much again. Many more videos on the way. We'll see you soon.